Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Well, um, just here to present uh, this year's team up to clean up. Uh, it happens every year, usually the first, first uh, weekend of May. Uh, this year it's May 6th or 5th. And uh, this has been a successful program for many years. I remember back in 93 being here and uh, helping with that program. And uh, it's just been a great success when it comes to the people of the town of Presque Valley. They just seem to just love it. And, uh, of course, I am with partnership with uh, Chamber of Commerce, which uh, Gloria here is part of the rep representative of that. And it's all, we're always proud to be together and work together. And, uh, you know, they help us out with the spring cleanup we do every year, uh, including with... Um, with our uh, adopt a street program now these wonderful businesses and churches that do this are just great they go out there keep our community say uh, uh, beautiful and you know pick up all the garbage that people lay around if you notice you know our main thoroughfares are usually very well taken care of and that's not just due to uh, public works or other you know it's due to the adopt a, uh, a street program uh, it's it's very highly um, it's a nice thing to have for the town of Presque Valley it helps us a lot and just to mention some of the, the, the people that, are, that actually uh, are part of this organization, it's like the Emanuel Lutheran Church. We got the National Association of Active and Retired Federal um, Employee Chapter, uh, 2106, Mount Valley Church of God, uh, Arizona Agribusiness and Equine Center. Uh, we got the Roe Foundation, the First Southern Baptist Church, um, uh, Project Messiah, and so forth, the Early Early Bird Lions Club, uh, all these all these uh, uh, participants have been just terrific, you know, in helping us uh, keep our town clean. And every year we send them a letter, basically stating how much we do appreciate them, um, and basically it just it just states that you guys are express our, our Appreciation for your organization, participation in the town's adopt the street program. Thank you for the, uh, the, the contribution your organization uh, makes in keeping us, our town, a wonderful place to live. And that is, that's just part of what the letter says, but uh, that is actually true. They, they help a lot in keeping our community clean. And as you know, uh, we are located uh, down at the treatment plant. Um, it's on Valley Road, and I wish I knew the address to it, and I forget the address to the treatment plant. Uh, but if you go down Valley Road, just uh, east of Navajo, uh, you will find us. As you can see in our picture, you can't really miss us. We got we got barrels that are you know uh, shine up like like nobody's business, and everybody's wearing orange and and so forth for reflect, reflectivity. And just people just love just to come in and just give us all their their uh, garbage and, and and so forth. Now. Uh, that being said, um, we do uh, take, uh, you know, certain, certain items um, that, like, uh, the acceptable items would be yard clippings, furniture, and other residential uh, items. The recycled items would be old appliances, plastics one and two, aluminum, uh, newspapers, and tires. Now, we like to tell everybody, only bring a max of 10 tires to our to our facility. Sometimes we get a truckload and we wondered, okay, where are these tires coming from? <laughs> Even though, you know, we appreciate them trying to, you know, bring the tires to us and, and so forth, you know, we try to make, keep it to a max of 10. Um, so, in other words, you know, uh, we, this year's uh, uh, lowest bidder was uh, waste management and um, they came in at uh, 36, 362, 50. Um, and it's a little higher than we've had in the past, but I feel that uh, last year we had over three, just about over 300 tons of, uh, of debris and, and garbage, and this year we're predicting at least 400. Um, the times are good. Uh, people are trying to, you know, get rid of all their stuff and, and, and so forth and not recycle them as much as they did in the past. Uh, so we do expect a, a pretty good turnout this year. And uh, with the help of Gloria, Gloria and the Chamber of Commerce, I think this is going to be another successful year for a team up to clean up. I do have a little, can you help me with that slideshow? Oh, sure. I do have a little slideshow for you just to show what we did last year with the team up to clean up because we partner with you guys. We have um, businesses that bring a lot of their kids, a lot of their, <clears throat> excuse us for a second. 
us, us two are not very technical here. <laughs> we have to get somebody that knows how to do this. Technical problem here. <laughs> So we need an engineer to yeah, yeah, we have to have an engineer to do our things for us. And <laughs> Neil's just been terrific on that. Alex, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Yes. Oh, sorry. It wasn't me. While you're while he's setting it up, could you do you have a list of items that we should not bring to the cleanup? I, I think that's important. I know we publicize it and it's in the newsletter, but you can't repeat it too many times. Yeah, uh, not accepted items. I'm sorry, non-accepted items, and I should have mentioned that, thank you, sir, um, would be paints, medical waste, explosives, ammunitions, propane tanks, and hazardous, um, hazardous items. Regarding paint, what if it's dried, dried up and it's not liquid anymore? Uh, you know, that is an acceptable, uh, uh, we can accept that. Um, and, and thank you, sir, because if you do want to uh, bring us the paint, it does have to be completely dry. It has been set out to where it becomes completely solid. Once, once you guys do that, or, or if the people want to do that, yes, uh, we, we will accept that. But when it, in a liquid form, no, we can't do that. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, we're going to try this again. Marnie made up these slides, <clears throat> and she put, well, it is going to be this year, May 5th, 2018. And then we um, do both town and, and, and around our area. So let's see if we can get some pictures of last year. We provide free T-shirts for people that come. So uh, we normally order, you know, a couple hundred T-shirts, and they all come in. And they want a t-shirt. Everybody wants to come in and get a t-shirt. We change colors every year, so last year was red. Um, it wasn't called really red. It was called cherry something, but, you know, it was red. <clears throat> so, and then we have lots of people that help us, uh, vol a lot of volunteers. Uh, some of our chamber volunteers come and help us. And it's always a fun day because then the people come in. In the morning at 9 o'clock, we give them the bags to pick up with. Uh, we do ask them to bring gloves and, and you know, just ah, something like that to pick up stuff with, or grabbers. They have little grabbers, too. But then they come in, and they take their bags, and, and we have a huge map that shows locations where to go, like down Glassford Hill Road. The map's not up there. Glassford Hill Road and Windsong and, you know, all those streets where there's fences along Glassford Hill and all that collects right in there. We make sure that those are all cleaned up. And then anywhere else, Second Street, First Street, all of those areas, we try to clean up everything. And then, of course, we're with the early bird lions, Roar Larry. And he does a lot with picking up for the elderly that I know through the town, but the lions help with that too. And he has a group of men that come and help him with that. So, and that's always a great, a great thing. Let's see what else we got here. Um, yeah, by broadcasting. It's not coming up on our screen. It, it's up there. It, yeah. We can't see it. Okay. <clears throat> oh, sorry. It came up now. Uh, Yavapai Broadcasting partners with us and does a, a live remote the whole time we're there. And then they provide uh, Papa John's Pizza. And they go into town and they pick up Papa John's Pizza and they bring it out for us. And then they um, let people just come out and have free pizza. There's some more. We have groups, groups of kids that come. Uh, Shin Poo Rin, that top right one, was the biggest group last year, and you can see how many kids they have. Uh, it was a ton. I don't remember what the count was. but And then we give them prizes for the largest group, the most unusual thing they picked up, the oddest thing they picked up, just prizes for little things that um, everybody wants a prize. Cleaning up along the road, they get out there and get really down and dirty and really do some cleaning up and then of course our firemen come our firemen come about 11 10 30 11 o'clock and roast hot dogs for us so they do the hot dogs for us roast them and then we provide uh, everybody with a free lunch a hot dog lunch chips cookies um, water and so you know it's a great day everybody loves to come back and get a roasted hot dog with a fireman there's some more of our guys eating and passing out food. 
Oh, this was a good one of the dump day that we had. <laughs> All that good junk out there. I think there's one more. And some of the prizes are like bottles of water or bottles of soda. Not bottles of water, bottles of soda. Uh, Jerry Coyman donated water with her little koozies last year. And so that was fun. People were always coming, oh, I want one of those, I want one of those. And so when they were out, then everybody's asking for another koozie. But, but then we give away little prizes, candy or something for, you know, the different things that we have that um, something fun for them to go pick up. Yep, that was the last one. So it is a fun day for us. We love to get out there and, and help and help do our part with cleaning up. So it's a great partnership between us and the town. Tar Hill Towing then goes around and picks up all the bags that we've collected for everybody and tries to get them all picked up for us. So it's, it's a great partnership. Yes, it is. Alex it and I is. work together, and we even co color coordinated tonight. So. And that, that, was, that, was, that wasn't done on purpose, trust me. You know, Gloria did hit on something that I did not mention, and that was the people that are handicapped. Um, we do help the handicapped. If they, if they want to call the Public Works Department at 759-3070 a week in advance, um, we will go ahead and pick up, pick up their, their garbage or whatever they have on the, on, on the roadside. And these are for people that, that have, you know, uh, they're challenged, you know, possess a handicap and so forth and can't get out, we will help them. But they do have to call that number a week in advance. Good. Any questions, comments, anyone? The Lions Club. Anything else? You'll have to use the microphone, Gloria. The Lions Club does the pickup with okay. Larry in charge. He tells them all what to do. <laughs> Good job. We appreciate well, that. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, they'll be back on next week's agenda, I take it. Okay, next discussion, towing. Regulation update, Chief. Good evening, Mayor, Council. So this item is really uh, nothing more than to provide the Council with uh, information about changes in procedures in the Police Department's towing regulations. We think it's important that you understand what we're doing and more importantly, why. And I think most of you are aware an issue surfaced recently where a resident of Prescott Valley was taken advantage of after a vehicle she owned was towed. I um, believe you were all copied in on a correspondence she sent to the town seeking answers. In summary, this incident began after her estranged husband committed suicide. The vehicle was towed and impounded, and then she went to retrieve the vehicle, and she was presented with a bill for uh, $585. She was unable to pay this fee, and so she contacted the police department seeking some type of relief. Sergeant Rob Brown, who's our uh, traffic section supervisor, looked into it and asked the tow company for a copy of the invoice. Well, when they sent it, all the charges had been scratched out and new numbers written in. Funny thing was, well, it's not funny, but the, the thing was that even the, the new numbers were inflated and were improper. So as a result of our investigation, this company was removed from our rotation for at least one year and um, at the time that I wrote my remarks this afternoon, I said that uh, reinstatement of that company would only occur if they were to refund the citizen the amount overcharged. I sent this company a letter, oh, probably three weeks ago, stating just that, that uh, they would never be placed back on our rotation list unless they made good to the, the woman that they victimized. And so today I was presented with a check for $133 made out to that woman, so she is going to get uh, her overcharged amount back. So another thing, though, that we discovered is that almost every towing company is engaging in a practice where they charge an individual the very maximum allowed under our prior regulations. And that was $200, plus they would throw in mileage, $3.50 a mile, storage, $30 a day for storage, and then extras, so if it was a, a large vehicle, they would charge more. If it was slightly off the road, they would consider that an off-road tow, they would charge more for that. And in the end, you'd end up with a bill of $585. And so the, the, disparity, the disparity was, if you as a citizen had your vehicle break down in your driveway and you called any one of these towing companies, they would probably charge you uh, around $85 to tow your vehicle somewhere. If I call them, or if we call them as a member of the police department, it was automatically $200. And so the mileage that they were charging would be the mileage back to where they were taking the car. So 
you could have a tow company whose main storage yard was in Chino Valley. It could be in Black Canyon City for all we know. And they were charging people $3.50 a mile for that kind of a distance. And so while I recognize that we certainly in, in Prescott Valley encourage a free open market, um, by having so many companies on this rotation list renders it nearly impossible for my staff to conduct the inspections at these tow yards that would catch or prevent these types of abuses. They just, they just don't have that kind of time. And so it's our sincere hope that the changes to our regulations that Sergeant Brown will present to you in just a moment will prevent these undesirable business practices and more importantly, protect our residents from predatory price gouging. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob Brown and uh, let him talk to you about the new regulations. Thank you. Greetings, Sergeant. Council. Oh, sorry. So uh, Cindy um, Cochran, Right, uh, helped uh, put this PowerPoint together. The first portion of this is what our current regulations are. Uh, this is all a customer service based. We're trying to provide the best service to the customers we possibly can under federal guidelines and uh, statutory requirements that we have. So I'll get through the first portion. The very last slide is what we're changing to, and then I, I can take some questions if you will. So, we're, so the first part, Um, basically, the Federal Aviation Act is what got, gives us the guidelines and the classifies the vehicle towing companies as interstate carriers. So that's the guidelines that we follow. The exceptions, regular, re, the regulations reasonably related to public safety, which is us, which would be anything that's not public safety because I'm public safety. It's anything that's a safety hazard on the roadway at the time, so like an emergency situation. Uh, toes performed without the consent of the owner, which are non-consensual toes, and that's something where I am directed by statute to remove a car. Okay, I don't have a choice. I'm supposed to take it. Um, ARS also provides that a city or town may enter, enter into a contractual agreement with a towing company firm, um, which is awarded on the basis of competitive bidding uh, and municipality towing regulations dealing with qualifications for towing services to perform non-consensual police order tows are not preempted by federal law. So within the state, we can also uh, make some uh, improvements on that. So the regulations must be reasonable, related, and generally responsive to public safety concerns. So this is what we took and this is what we created. Two years ago, we did make a change to the towing regulations that we had to try to improve them. Um, for everybody to bring the cost down. Uh, we found now that we need to do that again, so that's why we readdressed it. The PV rotation system currently, there's a list of qualified towing companies requested by dispatchers on a rotational basis. So we have a list of 10 companies uh, that we put it out. Currently, I think we have eight um, different tow companies. And this is only for the town officers who request tows. So if somebody says, hey, I want so-and-so to tow my car, uh, that is consensual tow, and we will call that tow. This, the rotation is only if the person is unable to say, hey, call this specific tow company. So if I have to take them to jail, or if they're injured, they go to the hospital, and I can't say, hey, who do you want your car to go to? That's what the rotation is for. Uh, tow companies agree to respond within 30 minutes. Uh, that's to clear the roadways as soon as possible. It's to tow and store all vehicles in a timely, safe manner, as prescribed underneath the regulations to provide towing charge not to exceed 200 and a daily storage not to uh, exceed $30. So I can tell you the 200, that's on the initial tow. There's a bunch of stuff that they will stick on, you know, just to drive the car around to the front gate. Um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, fees for an abandonment, uh, app uh, applying for an abandonment title. So that $200 that you're seeing here, that is only for the initial tow. Um, so. The annual application requirements uh, are $200 towing fee. So currently, if you wanna be on our tow rotation, uh, they give us a $200 towing fee and that allows us to go through and check their application, make sure they have the proper documentation, which would be um, all the proper company contact information, the names of the drivers and the, their licenses and their tow vehicles, the vehicle information, so each vehicle that they own uh, that they're gonna use on our rotation, 
proof of insurance with the town named as additional insured, uh, current fee schedule. So we actually made them uh, give us um, a fee sheet. So with their bills, because what we found one, when we logged on to a tow company's website, there's not a fee schedule. So when you go to Walmart, you pick up a toothbrush, you know how much it costs. They don't have that. So we made them each create it so we can give them a guideline and hold them to a standard if something like what just happened, happened. So uh, we created that. Uh, the town business license, proof of valid DPS tow tr registration and ID number. So for suspension, revocation, and uh, from the ro rotation. So if we wanted to remove or suspend somebody from our current rigs, uh, no valid DPS towing license, so DPS revokes their right to tow. No valid insurance as required by law and these regulations. Uh, bankruptcy proceeding, providing false records or documentation relating to the tow services or information required by these regulations. And I just realized I'm not even clicking forward. You guys want me to? <laughs> You have, to, you have to say something. You were being nice. I'm new at this. All right, where are we at? Okay, so the current schedule, um, town business license. So we'll go down to the next one. This is where we're currently at, uh, about halfway down. Imposition of charges in excess of the regulations, so that's what we just currently had. Failure to respond to a tow request or within the, the time requirement. So we do have tow companies, we call them, they say, hey, what kind of car is it? We tell them, ah, we don't want that one. And that will be a violation. Um, the last would be multiple complaints and or failure to abide by state and local laws or the regulations. So a tow company may request an administrative review if they get removed from um, or suspended. They review for an application denial or suspension, revocation, or termination. Request shall be in writing and clearly present um, the company's position. They may meet with the chief of police to present and give their point of view. And within five days of meeting with the chief, he should provide a final decision in writing and explain the basis for their decision. Well, we recognize that uh, there is further steps that can be taken. So in the appeal, uh, the appeals to the chief's final decision, if they so desire, are made to the town manager. The appeals shall be in writing and clearly present, uh, present the towing company's position. Within five days, once again, the town manager will give his uh, final notifications. And the town manager's decision shall be in writing and shall explain the basis for the decision. So that's kind of what we have. Uh, the appeal and the removal is all kind of, it's gonna stay the same. We have updated the rigs, and so what we're changing, uh, we're gonna reduce the maximum rate for tows to $100. We're gonna define the storage date as a midnight of one day to midnight the next, and that came into place because some companies, as soon as they drive the car on the bed of the truck onto their property, they consider that to be storage. And I'm like, you can't store something if it's not even removed off of your tow truck. Limits to storage fees to $30 and prorated by the hour on the first day of storage. Uh, limits the mileage fees to seven miles at 350 per mile. Uh, that was, we took all the average basically of all the mileage and we averaged them between all the tow companies that not only that we have on our, on, on our system now, any of the ones that applied to be on our tow list. So we took that, and then we took the average of seven miles, which would be anywhere in the point of town, to the exit of town, and we thought that that was a fair uh, mileage to use. It, pro it prohibits add-on fees for access to vehicles during normal business hours or by appointment during normal business hours. This would, re this would also control a company charging $40 to drive the vehicle from the back to the front to give it to the party who's there to pick it up. Uh, requires tow companies who desire to participate on the town's rotation list to provide monthly reports to Prescott Valley for all of their rotation tows. Now this is the biggest one. Uh, I think it's gonna make a, a, a huge impact. Basically every month they will have to supply us with a list of all the vehicles that they towed and the cost that they charge the citizenry so we can go back and, and easily watch. And I can tell you that we have multiple different types of tows. We tow cars that are broken down on the side of the road. We tow cars that are from accidents. We tow cars from people that we arrest. We tow cars um, on what we refer to as 3511, which is a mandatory impoundment. So um, we, we do, if you can imagine, 800 
or so accident six it, it fluctuates between like 697 to up to 800 accidents a year uh, we don't tow all of those cars but we do tow a good portion of it uh, the 3511s it's uh, on an average of about 500 cars and then the arrests uh, it's well over that so I mean this this is a, a quite of a, a big thing and so what we've done is we're going to try to institute this uh, starting July 1st we'll put it out and give everybody the opportunity to um, be placed on the list we'll review all their documentation we'll pick the top 10 uh, if we have more than 10, we'll, we'll stop it at 10. If we don't have 10 that put in, then we'll accept all the ones that we that we find that meet our requirements, and uh, and we'll try to do a better job of uh, making sure that they're treating the citizens with uh, respect and the proper customer service that we do. Questions, anyone? Uh, yeah. Uh just to give an analogy between uh, f regarding, uh, let's say, uh, the medical insurance, okay? You get, uh, you get the recap of the charges that your doctor charged your insurance company. So let's say your doctor put in a f charge of $400, uh, but the insurance company only paid them 100 because that's the, that's the amount that they pay on their schedule, and then they don't charge you anymore. Uh, is there any way for us to do a similar thing where they agree to charge these prices uh, and you, you, they're basically signing a contract, you know, by agreeing to be one of our tow companies so that our, so somebody whose car is towed due to an accident or some other, you know, reason, uh, they don't get charged an exorbitant amount of money and they have to stick to those regulations. Similar to, like I said, the insurance company. I mean, if anybody has seen, you know, a recap from let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield, you, you see what the doctor charges, you see what Blue Cross and Blue Shield pay and those numbers are not the same and, and they're, they're tr tremendously different. And the doctor has signed on saying he will not uh, collect any more than what the insurance company is paying. Well, I can I can answer that saying that uh, when we did do two years ago and again this year, we did look at all the other uh, tow regulations from other towns, DPS. Uh, when we put this together and we looked at all the pricing from all the different tow companies, and, and my understanding is we don't want to get in the habit of telling um, a business, hey, this is how much you're going to charge for your certain item. Um, that, that muddies the water a little bit. So what we can do is say, hey, on average, this is what the tow bills are, and this is what we think is acceptable for this. Because what we did find was when we put a $200 limit on the tow, they were charging other fees that they didn't tell us that they were going to charge. And so what we did is say, hey, an average tow, uh, when we came across it, I think we, we it was right around 65 to $70. And so then we, we built in a little bit of money in there if they wanted to add in something else. Uh, we, we took the, uh, a generous cleanup and everybody was between, you know, uh, $10 and $30 for a scene cleanup uh, for an hour. So we gave them 25 minutes for a scene cleanup for 30 minutes. So we, would, we were a little bit more generous because sometimes we do have scenes that need a lot more cleanup. Um, but we just didn't want to get in the practice of setting uh, a private business's price points. I think I might have your answer. So in the past, they could do exactly what you're saying. Uh, this, under these new regulations, the only variable is going to be the daily storage fee, and that's only going to be dependent on actual time spent in the yard. That's the only thing that's going to vary. The maximum they're going to charge is $100 for the tow and seven miles times $3.50. So there's no add-ons. That's the, the the last paragraph is the big one. I think it's the last one. No, second to last one. No no add-on fees. And like uh, Sergeant Brown was talking about, we had tow companies that would you'd go to pick up your car, and then you'd say, okay, it's going to be a forty dollar fee for me to go get it in my yard and drive it to the front. <coughs> we had another one where um, some people were were kind of transient and they were living in a motorhome and it ended up getting towed. And the tow company wanted to charge them $1,600 to allow them to go get their personal belongings out of the motorhome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, these are the kinds of practices that, that come to our attention, but we don't know about it unless people are willing to come forward and make the complaints. And so 
th these are designed, these, these regulations now are designed to prohibit all of those charges. So you could pretty much figure out what, it, what every tow is going to cost, the only variable again being storage. Yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that with the adoption of these new regs that we're cutting police requested towing the cost of those in half or better than in half by eliminating the predatory fees that were being charged for accessory uh, activities. And so uh, to that end, uh, we, we believe this is a step in the right direction. Thank you. That's all right. We, we also also uh, put our regulations up on our web page so anybody can log on and see exactly what it should be and a complaint form. So if they need to file some type of a complaint or have us look into something specifically, uh, that is now easily available for them online if they want to come down and make it in person. Laura? Uh, I just want to say thank you. All of us have been following this issue, obviously. We've been kept informed all along the way. It was appalling, and um, I'm grateful that it was brought forward. Otherwise, we might have other people being victimized out there, and I know you put a lot of time into it, and I'm so grateful uh, that you, you did such an outstanding job. We do have a responsibility to protect our citizens where we have opportunity to do so, and you've done just that. And I want to thank you. Um, the sad part is the statement you made, Chief. Unless a citizen comes forward, we don't know about it. And those are the things that bother me, the things we don't know about. And that, that monthly report that we will now be requiring is going to be a huge step in helping us maintain control and, and, and conduct our quality control inspections of, of this process. So that's going to be huge. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I appreciate the, uh, the lady who did write us, I think, and, and let us know her uh, experience. And I think... If anything, it's just a rule of thumb. You know, I think uh, when we don't hear anything, we feel everything is going pretty well. So we need to hear from you if those things are not going well or if you feel there's something going on that shouldn't be happening. So I appreciate that, and I do like the, the regulations, and hopefully we'll be, um, you know, rigorous in terms of those reports that there are repercussions if we don't have those uh, companies meeting the uh, requirements that we set forth. And, uh, Look forward to uh, hopefully a better tow in the future. So. Any other questions? I got one here. That's on your uh, <clears throat> towing uh, or daily storage fees. If he's pursuant to twenty-eight, thirty-five, eleven, fifteen dollars daily storage fees for all other tows, and I, for some reason I'm not. Yeah. So the the thirty-five, eleven, the ARS uh, twenty-eight dash thirty-five, eleven. That's a state statute for uh, specific stuff like. Uh, drive, somebody's driving on a suspended license or revoked or they don't have the proper uh, breath device in their car and the state actually mandates that through state law that it's a $15 a day storage. Um, that's the only time that that is acceptable. So everything else of the $30, that's an average of all the other tow companies. Does that answer question the question? Mike, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, if I could just mention at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Officer Brown's, uh, Sergeant, Sergeant, Sergeant Brown. 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 Uh, uh, he explained to us that we have some limitations uh, in terms of how we approach things that uh, require us to jump through, through some hoops. You know, years ago, the federal government basically said we don't want local governments and states regulating the fees that these companies can charge in general. So we can't say, we can't, as the town of Prescott Valley say, this is all that a towing company can charge, period, in order for them to get a business license. What we can do is we can say, if we call you in on our rotation to do a non-consensual tow, this is what we're going to require you to do. You can charge whatever you want, but, uh, you know, in other toes and other circumstances, but if you want to be part of our program, this is what we're going to require. And there's a further nuance. We've, for 20 years, followed this rotation process where we allow 
many companies to be involved. Some communities will put it out to bid and they'll enter into a contract with just one or two companies. Maybe they'll do it on an annual basis. And so then on a contractual basis, they even get more detailed in what they require. The town has tried to find a balance being in favor of encouraging competition and encouraging business, as we typically do, it has tried not to get over <coughs> involved in regulation, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the regulations read the way they read in the past. And so uh, what we're doing is we're taking some steps to tighten those up in hopes that we're not going too far in, in regulating beyond what we can do. Okay, good. Sergeant, I think you've done a great job. Thank you. Chief, appreciate, appreciate that. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, we move on then to number five, discussion, Jasper Development Agreement. Richard? I apologize. Apparently, you can't uh, see that on screen, so you can careen your neck all you want because it's uh, shown behind you. Um, this is the layout of the uh, Jasper. It's up there? It came up. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Neil. It's really nice to have Neil around um, some days. But <laughs> uh, just as a reminder, we haven't done a development agreement and we haven't entertained or approved a large new master plan in Prescott Valley for some years, and that's because we kind of stumbled a little bit uh, during the Great Recession, and we had a large inventory of lots uh, that were made available through subdivision activities and agreements that we did in the late 1990s. And we're very pleased that uh, the developer of Jasper is elected to uh, develop in the town of Prescott Valley, and uh, they've gone through not only the annexation process, uh, but zoning entitlement. You've seen all that over the course of the last a few years, and most recently the Planning and Zoning Commission has been looking at more of the finer detail uh, with preliminary development plans, which will culminate uh, next week with uh, your consideration of a final development plan for the first two phases of JASPER, uh, which is in the central lower portion of uh, this illustration. The development agreement uh, that's put forth sets out uh, certain agreements or understandings between the two parties as it relates to phasing of public infrastructure, uh, how that infrastructure will be not only developed, how it will be conveyed to the town, um, other uh, agreements between the parties about, in this case, upsizing infrastructure that will benefit the town into the future and reimbursements uh, through various mechanisms uh, for the developer <clears throat> to be ma made whole for that upsizing of public uh, infrastructure. It also uh, causes repayment for other infrastructure that the town has visited on adjoining properties that the town may have paid for and now is looking for reimbursement for those improvements which makes this project possible. Uh, it also <clears throat> talks about the, uh, com the completed project, what it's going to look like, what uh, Aspects are going to be contained as it relates to parks, uh, trailhead locations, in this case a new trailhead for the Iron King Trail with bathrooms and things like that that's going to be developed by the developer, not by the town of Prescott Valley, but ultimately turned over to the town of Prescott Valley to benefit people who are using the trail uh, parking uh, features as well. This agreement also uh, works to uh, try to balance the cost to the developer for the initial infrastructure improvements with those benefits that are derived to the town of Prescott Valley for public infrastructure. One example of that is the building of a water storage tank that is necessary not only to support this development but is added to by the town of Prescott Valley so as to create greater capacities for future development if that development is wanted or needed. Also, the expansion of uh, mainline 
uh, water line improvements so as to make available water for future development should that development further uh, occur further to the north. Um, <clears throat> it's not an easy process. It takes some time. There is a certain art to putting these together because it is a negotiation. Um, obviously, we're sensitive to the development community, but we also have to be sensitive to the needs of the town of Prescott Valley. So the town of Prescott Valley is in a position where development pays for itself. And that's been a long-standing tenant of our relationships with development in the town of Prescott Valley, and that's the reason why we charge things like development impact fees to be able to uh, cover the costs associated with that new development. Um, I'm not intending at this point, but I'm certainly um, able to rest respond to very specific aspects of the agreement. If you want to get to that detail, I'm certainly um, uh, able to do so. I do want to take a moment and, and not only recognize my colleague, Ivan Legler, uh, for spending the time and effort and working on weekends necessary to bring this thing quickly to the town council. Um, it's his job, but he does it very well, and he's very uh, certain about getting things done on a time frame. <clears throat> Unusual in my experience in dealing with attorneys. My compliments. By the way, I think you have a very stately looking gentleman in the back that would like to comment. Uh, yeah, he's kind of lurking back there, but the other one I wanted to bring to light is uh, uh, Neil Wadsworth. Yeah, this is the first opportunity he's had in his career here to work together to try to balance the needs of the town and the desires of the town with the reality of the cost of doing development. And, and I wanted to um, recognize him because it's not easy for him in managing his portion of the world, which is as a utilities director, bringing water and sewer improvements and making sure that those things are there available uh, when uh, development occurs and there's a balancing act there as well. But again, my compliments to Ivan because he burned the midnight oil as he seemingly tends to do to get this done, and, and I for one appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I know that uh, Jason may have uh, some things to say, but uh, I can share, at least from my vantage point, that uh, working in this jurisdiction, uh, there is a sense of fairness um, between the, the development community and the town of Prescott Valley. And I'm often uh, reminding staff and some of the citizenries that uh, people's choices to invest their capital here means that the town of Prescott Valley will uh, receive uh, tens of millions of dollars from this development over time. Certainly it will cost money to uh, uh, have this development take place, but the town of Prescott Valley will also receive benefits from charging development impact fees, sales tax revenue, and things like that. Um, very important things to uh, providing the level of services that this town council has elected to provide over the time of my tenure here with the town of Prescott Valley. But with that, I'd conclude my remarks, and before we ask uh, Mr. Giese to come up if he chooses to make any comments. I'd certainly uh, respond to any questions that you, Mr. Mayor, or members of the the council may have. Good. Questions, anyone? Uh, of Mr. Giese. You have questions of Mr. Giese? I'd certainly yield the floor. If there's nothing else, I guess uh, you're on. Welcome, uh, Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. I was standing because I've been riding in a car. We were down at Rocky Point with the family for spring break, so. But I made it back on time. That was the good news. No car accidents on the way up the hill. So we're excited. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, don't have any, uh, well, normally I don't have anything scripted. So um, Jasper's a great opportunity for us. It's going to be a great subdivision. Um, obviously, we're under construction presently um, at risk. We started the grading. Um, we have a great market window here that we're trying to take advantage of to the best degree possible. Um, mass grading, just to give you an update, mass grading should uh, be done here by the end of this month. Uh, utilities are out to bid. I think we award that contract next week. Um, and we'll start delivering lots and building houses. The first model complex, I'm going to tell you, uh, probably comes in August. 
um, but as we progress through the project and pave out the subdivisions, we'll, we'll add the models and get the vertical construction started um, as the rest of the year plays out. Presently, the subdivision is scheduled to be completed uh, by April 1 of 2019. We're building, uh, I believe, 366 lots in the first phase. Um, Mandalay Homes will be a, uh, a large purchaser of those lots. Um, and we're, we're excited to get started. So uh, we started early. Um, but so far, things are going well. And I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you all have. I want to make a couple of remarks, and then I do have some questions. I, I personally was frustrated at all the delays, and now I realize how beneficial it's been to you. And the reason I say that is I hardly have a day go by that I don't get something in my mailbox or on my door of someone wanting to buy my house. So that means the timing is hotter and better <laughs> than it's ever been. So I'm happy for you on that. Thank you. Um, I get a lot of questions about water because I serve on two water boards, so I'm not going to trouble you with any of that. Okay. But we can reassure everyone that it's not an issue. What I do have a lot of people asking me about is their dismay about how this will impact the Iron King Trail, and I know you already know about that. So I wanted to give this opportunity to share <laughs> what is actually happening along that segment, what the distance is, and your plan to actually enhance that and not detract from it. Sure. So, so we, we definitely are aware of folks that are concerned about the Iron King We've since the day we started. And um, in, in my line of work, we, we make messes before we make things look nice at the end of the job. And many times the members of the public aren't real patient um, and I understand that. So as it relates to the trail, you basically, you have a hundred foot wide right of way that the town of Prescott Valley owns. Um, and that's not an easement that's owned in fee simple by the town forever. Um, outside of, um, that right of way, then our private land would start both north and south of the Iron King. And because this area is visible and beautiful, obviously folks have been concerned. So. In the first phase, a couple of things. I'm going to start on the uh, south side of the trail. Um, we've mass graded a very large drainage channel in uh, on the south side of the trail that, that is taking nuisance water off of Glassford Hill, collecting it, if you will, and then conducting it through the site over the course of time. And, and we've mass graded, I believe, the entire length um, to our western border. Um, we've done that on purpose to try to get it out of the way. Um, uh, frankly, as it sits today, it's ugly, in my opinion, and unsightly. Um, so the next thing that we'll start to do, which I believe starts next week, is start to shape that uh, channel to the degree possible. We, we have to have the water pass through there from an engineering perspective. But um, no different than uh, the sides of a golf course where you mound it, give it some texture, and try to start to soften it up instead of uh, it looks very industrial right now to me. Um, we do that. Um, we approved a change order last week um, to basically cut a channel inside a channel to try to approve the aesthetics. And what we're trying to do is get it to, to meander and not be so hard-edged if you will, so between shaping it and, and meandering a channel into the bottom, um, we, we try to alter the visual aspects of that channel. Um, we're experimenting right now. We, we have uh, quite a bit of rock north of 89A on the ranch, and so we've been crushing different veins of rock in order to try to find a color um, that, number one, we like, um, and number two, we would have plenty of for, for the course of time um, so that everything matches into the future. Um, the, I bring that up because a rock will have ground cover and rock, um, bare grass, uh, native shrubs, drought resistant, um, and then trees that, that will get planted 
um, in the channel and, and also on the north side of the trail. Um, so as we transition north of uh, the Iron King Trail, same thing, we'll shape it, go in and grade it. You'll start to see that over the next few weeks. Um, we'll um, dress it up and, and in our opinion, leave it um, in a better uh, state than, than what we found it in. Um, and so I suppose, you know, being candid, there'll be some folks that say, well, we don't like that. Um, there always is. Um, but that we're spending um, a lot of money uh, because the Iron King Trail is an amenity for the town, the area, and the subdivision. And we want to maximize and enhance that, that asset as best we possibly can. Last thing that I'll touch on is the trailhead. So um, just south of the trail at the entrance, we will develop a trailhead. Richard uh, spoke to that a bit earlier. We haven't designed that architecturally yet because frankly, phase one is real expensive. And so uh, I anticipate that we'll build the trailhead as part of the development of phase two. Um, and the, the idea is to A, create you know, a, a place for people to congregate, organize, use that trail, uh, park, um, shade structure definitely be a part of that. Um, you know, there's 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 a couple of really good examples around the state of, of trailheads well done in urban situations or settings, and so uh, we we won't get too original. We'll we'll rely on what's what's gone uh, uh, been well received, I guess I should say, at you know Pinnacle Peak or the McDowell Mountain Ranch. Uh, there's multiple places where we can look at really great trailheads, kind of award-winning trailheads. And, and, and again, we're looking to enhance the amenity um, for the benefit of ourselves, certainly, but also for the, the future residents of Jasper and the existing residents in the town of Prescott Valley. I, I very much want to thank you. Of course, I was aware of a great deal of this, but when I tried to share it with citizens, they didn't believe me. So. Now it's a public record, and I personally want to thank you for the extensive planning, uh, the costly planning, and further costly impl implementation. I didn't know about the planning for the trailhead, and that's really exciting, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And I want to thank you for that sensitivity. Thank you. Ready? Yeah. Uh, well, Laura Lee asked uh, my first question. And, I'm, and I really appreciate the answer and the fact that there's going to be a trailhead improvement uh, with all the amenities there. I, I think that's great. And the fact that you're thinking so hard about channeling the water out of there, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Uh, the question I have now is on the map, it's only phase 15 where you're showing multiple, it's top left, uh, where you're showing multiple multiple uh, dwellings, multiple family dwellings. Are there any other sections in there that are going to be a multiple family or are they all going to be homes? Um, I'm going to tell you that the answer is there will be more areas where there will be multifamily development proposed over the course of time. Um, right now, uh, the, the single family dwelling units are selling well, the houses are selling very well. Uh, we, see, we see a definite opportunity for multifamily as part of Jasper. It doesn't have a commercial aspect to it at all. Outside of adding those rooftops will support the commercial activity on Glassford Hill and on the highway. Um, so the, ans the direct answer is yes, we will be coming back with more multifamily in the future. And then, then there's a question because as, as it's, it's interesting, as economic fortunes increase, uh, many times multifamily can can be looked down upon. Um, and so what, what we're going to be striving for is um, multifamily that is fits well, not only with Jasper but Granville. Um, our goal isn't, isn't to create something that, that is out of, out of step. So for instance, uh, the Fane development uh, across from the arena. Um, up north of the Alwafria, so the big green band uh, coming through from east to west is the Alwafria River drainage, and then the multifamily that would be towards 89A. I, I can see where it, where that application could be more standard, a stacked vertical type multifamily application. 
um, on the Granville border, there could be an opportunity for a single level. Um, the, the, the trend in multifamily is that not all multifamily looks like an apartment anymore. Uh, people like to live in detached units, even if they don't own them. Um, and so um, we, we have been heavily, I've been spending a lot of time looking at garden apartment complexes in the valley that are, are very popular actually all over the state. Um, but, but those units look, they're single level, look like a single family detached house. Um, but but they're for rent instead of for sale. But w one of the big trends in the marketplace is that that folks don't all feel like they need to own a home anymore. Yeah, um, renting is more accepted, I guess. Or it, it just things were different post Great Recession that way. Anyway, the uh, the plan looks great. And uh, how long do you anticipate before the whole thing is built out? I mean, do you have a Projected. I mean, I know there's no exact number. It depends on the economy and how that goes. Uh, I, I was talking to Joe Contadino on the way into the meeting, and, and uh, Joe's having another great year next door. Um, I, I would guess that this project, it's, it's going to end up being approximately 3,000 units. Um, and I'm going to tell you that I, I'd love to say it's a 15-year timeline. Okay. Um, it just depends on what happens with recessions. We're going to have them. I yeah. don't expect it to be the Great Recession again, at least hopefully not. But we'll, we'll have some delays in that timeline. So maybe 15, 20 max would be yeah, my guess. Those, those are the questions we get. So sure. it's, it's great to have an answer for them and to be able to answer it. And like I said, I really like the layout and the plan and the, the, the placement of some of the parks and the way the roads run. So thank you. you know, I Look forward to seeing the whole thing finished. I, I can't wait to see the first phase finished. <laughs> that too. <Yes. laughs> Any other questions? Anyone? Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm. I guess the April 1st, 2019 would be the build out of first phase. Is that what you're first saying? First phase would be everything in the first phase complete right. okay. um, by April 1 of 19. Uh, we'll, we'll start the vertical houses, uh, the, the models, um, I believe, in August mm -hmm. based on the timeline presently. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think one thing that we're learning is that if there's a way in which to incorporate multifamily housing now versus later, it's probably better in terms of, uh, you know, the community knowing what the layout is, because I think we have some uh, existing developments that are looking at that. It's kind of a, a second uh, wave of, of development, and, and it's not that well received, I don't think. It just depends, obviously, on the configuration how that matches up with the uh, existing development but just a word you know to consider that and I do appreciate the fact also that you're willing to spend as much time and money on the trailhead because I think that is a very important aspect of our community and I agree with you it is an important aspect as far as an amenity for your your development as well thank you any other questions I'm sorry Richard more comments <laughs> yeah, one thing that did, I've been really pleased to see, and we worked with the developer, there are three access points into this project, and uh, initially Santa Fe Loop, um, Al Alcoma, which is uh, through um, Granville, uh, it's actually not been constructed, but there's right-of-way there, to bring people out to the second light that's going into Granville, but probably the neatest aspect of the transportation improvements for this is uh, Stone Ridge Drive, probably known as something other than Stone Ridge Drive, will be constructed from this project all the way to the south as part of this project. The key aspect of that is it will be the first road, if you meander all the way through Jasper Drive, it goes all the way over to the city of Prescott, which is the Prescott Dells, which is under construction. And for the first time ever in the, the Quad Cities, you'll be able to get on a uh, municipal surface street and drive between the two communities without getting on a state highway. And uh, that's an important novelty uh, in this development. And I need to applaud the developer because, of course, that's going to cost money. Certainly it will uh, create a great window uh, for the community. Uh, and have recognition on Highway 69. But those cross connections of roadways are an important component to, to good planning. 
And again, uh, the developer, though into a future phase, 700 units would be constructed before that occurs. But that's a real ha hallmark in terms of quality development in Prescott Valley. And again, I who knows, maybe I own a house in, in uh, this project and want to drive to see my friend in Prescott instead of having to get out on Glassford Hill Road, go to the highway, and then get back off at uh, Granite Dells Parkway. I'll be able to go see my friend not having to get on a state highway. It's something of notoriety that we've never seen here uh, in the Quad Cities. All right, Don't go away, time. Richard. Now I have questions for you. <laughs> uh, you brought up a really important topic. Um, I serve as an alternate to um, Councilwoman Mallory on Simple, and I know that they have concerns about traffic uh, this impacting the traffic on 89A as well as we do the additional Granville. But just what you were stating, I don't think has enough attention that people understand there won't be that need to always get on 89A. So the actual question here is, obviously traffic studies were done. What does the traffic study say that's going to happen to 89A? Well, uh, the traffic for 89A, they have a, a, a window into the future. They have a five-year look, and then they look further into the future. The, the problem with that is they don't have any money, meaning ADOT. Right. As part of the uh, development agreement, this developer, based on empirical data that was prepared as part of a traffic analysis that was done by a, a registered professional, shows that traffic from this project combined with existing background traffic will have an impact to the interchange at Glassford Hill Road to where there will be a need for two left dedicated on-ramp improvements onto 89A to carry the volumes of traffic. And there is a threshold at which they're responsible for paying that portion. In turn, this agreement also requires the developer to assist with construction of additional lane widths on Glassford Hill Road to again offset and carry that additional traffic to that destination if that's where people are going. But you're spot on. If you don't have to get on the highway necessarily to go get your goods and services, rather you can drive down Stone Ridge Drive and we hope that they all do and they drive down to the crossroads and get their goods and services, that's good for our community. Likewise, if people don't want to get on the highway and go someplace else, they can come through Prescott Valley down to the crossroads, even if they live in, in the city of Prescott and gain those goods and services. So it will act to uh, uh, disperse uh, traffic. Uh, people, the, the more opportunities they have to go places, the less traffic is visited on each neighborhood. And part of the justification and the traffic analysis for that additional roadway, which again, it will be phased over time. It won't be a very large road to begin with. It'll be very much like the construction of Glassford Hill Road that initially was two lanes. And those two lanes will uh, serve to offset the traffic that will be generated down the Santa Fe Loop, necessarily wanting to go to services or necessarily through existing neighborhoods in the county through Castle Canyon Mesa and will disperse that traffic as opposed to concentrated on one or few roads. Thank you, Richard. Again, that was another question that I got constantly. Now it's on public record, and let's hope people repeat it and share that information. And I'm not a traffic engineer, uh, and I read that stuff. Uh, it's kind of dry, uh, but they've gone to the extent of spending uh, thousands of dollars to engage professionals, and they did it to our scope of work um, so that uh, we understood the potential outcome of that study, and we shared the study and we came to conclusions that these things needed to take place, not necessarily right up front, but at a threshold in the future when they become necessary or warranted. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Richard, appreciate the, and Jason, it was good to see you. Appreciate the nice job. Okay, we move on then to uh, number six. Discussion, Summit 2 Water Tank and Stone Ridge Water Tank CIP number W425, Water Tank Design Professional <coughs> Services Agreement. Neil, you are up. Like 
Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. I wanted to uh, come and talk to you tonight about water tank design in general, um, but there are a couple of specific app applications that we're going to talk about. One of them happens to be the water tank um, that will be needed not only by us, but also by Jasper, so I'll be talking about um, that one as well, um, and the uh, Stone Ridge water tank. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in, in kind of leading up to that conversation is the design and construction of water tanks, and I wanted to look at concrete water tanks versus steel water tanks. Um, and so here in the near future, we're going to be, like I mentioned, talking about Stone Ridge. We're going to be talking about, and that's going to be a 2 million gallon tank. We're going to be talking about the Summit 2 or maybe Jasper water tank as a 3 million gallon tank. And then the concrete and steel. And the reason that I want to talk about that is because uh, right now all of our tanks that we have are steel. And we've done an evaluation and we believe that concrete tanks over the life cycle of the tank are actually more economical even though the upfront capital costs are going to be higher. And so to kind of go through this discussion, I've provided an outline of, of how I'm going to lead up to that discussion. We're going to talk about our historical maintenance costs for our tanks, a little bit about the construction costs of the two, and that will lead us into the life cycle analysis. And then we'll talk specifically about the summit location, the Stone Ridge location, and then sort of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and as you're aware, we've owned a water company now for 18 years, approximately. 1999 was when we uh, purchased the Shamrock Water Company. And as part of that, we have constructed over the years a number of tanks, two or three or four. Um, but the ones that we, when we purchased the systems, the ones that we had are all smaller tanks. Uh, most of those were um, around a million and a half or less gallons each, and we've done maintenance on those smaller tanks over the 20-year period of time. This uh, chart shows you what we've done in terms of capital expenditures on those tanks, but it does not include more of the routine maintenance that we've done uh, through our contract with uh, CH2M Hill as an annual, just as a maintenance repair and those sorts of things. So when we've gone out to bid uh, these are the costs that you're seeing on those. So with these, some of these smaller tanks, um, you can see that when we do an interior uh, paint job or coating and a minor repair for uh, some of the tanks, it's, it's you know $120,000 um, or $100,000. When we just do a, um, a washout or whatever, then it's less. It's $50,000, $40,000 in that range. So those are the kind of numbers that we're talking about with the smaller tanks, and then this provides a history of what we've what we've actually done on on a lot of the a lot of the other tanks as well, uh, where we we can show a history of having to do a washout and an inspection, minor repairs, and then interior and exterior coating. Part of the reason this is important is that we have a number of tanks that we've construct that we constructed since we took over and purchased the water system that are larger tanks that we have not done an, a full interior and exterior washout, sandblast, recoat on. We're coming up on some of those, like for example, the Victoria tank was one of the first tanks that we constructed after we got the system. So that was put in, you know, in about 2000 or so. We're coming up on a 20 year uh, period where we're going to need to do full interior, full exterior uh, type rehab work on. And so with our experience, what we've, what we've seen is that the typical washout and interior inspection, minor repairs, we need to do those every 10 years. With the interior and exterior full blast recoat, uh, we're looking at every 20 years. That's what we've experienced. Those numbers might be a little bit longer than what industry standard would say. Uh, industry standard might say every 10 years you've got, you should be doing a full interior and exterior uh, blast and recoat. We have pretty good water quality up here, 
and we like to watch our pennies, so we, we actually are pretty happy with doing it every 10 for the minor and every 20 for a major. So now, looking at the capital cost of a steel tank versus a concrete tank, typically industry says you're looking at 30% more for the construction of a concrete tank versus a steel tank. However, if you don't have to coat either, either paint the interior or exterior of the concrete tank, your annual or every 10 year, every 20 year period maintenance costs are much lower because you're not having to worry about the coating, which is the big deal on the steel tanks. And so there are a couple of different size tanks I've put up there for you for what the capital cost should be for the various size for the steel and the concrete tank. So we put all those numbers together, the upfront construction costs, the annual five year, 10 year, 20 year maintenance requirements, and we looked at it for three of the tanks that we've got here in the tank farm area, the Jane, the Peggy, and the Victoria tank. And we've projected those costs onto other tanks as well. And what, what it looks like to us based on our maintenance requirements is that we would look at a break-even period and that break-even period changes based on the size of the tank. So the smaller the tank, it looks like the steel tanks actually have a better life cycle cost analysis, whereas the larger tanks, it looks like the concrete. And, and that breakover appears to be at about the size of a one and a half million gallon tank. So one and a half million gallon tanks, we could go either way, um, but above one, it looks like it makes more sense for us to do a concrete tank instead of steel. And you can see the, the chart I, or the graph I put up here shows you what the three million gallon tank would, lo would look like with a possibly a 20 year break even period. Now these are for tanks that should last 50 years or 100 years. Um, we have a couple of tanks right now that are coming up on the 60 year mark and those are the ones in the Prescott Country Club. So here's the, here's the analysis just showing the break-even period plotted versus the size of the tank with a, there's a parabolic line in there that shows typically as the tank size gets bigger, the break-even period is dropping pretty dramatically. So that's with looking at it and, and making the assumption that the 30% cost differential is, is, is actually correct. <laughs> Looking at, the si looking at the two million gallon and the three million gallon tank, what we wanted to know was, okay, well, assuming we could accept a break-even period of say 60 years, what could that capital cost differential actually be? And it looks like for the cost range that we're talking about, it looks like even a 50% higher cost um, might still pan out for us. As I mentioned, all 13 of our existing tanks are constructed of, of steel. Um, there are five of them listed up there that are bigger than one million gallons. So those, those might, might be ones that could have qualified to be, you know, as, as uh, constructed of concrete. Um, the remaining tanks that we have are all less than one million gallons. So, you know, what we're proposing is ultimately, and what I'm presenting to you is that we would, we would like to move forward with the construction of a couple of concrete tanks. Um, and so we have two tanks that are coming up this next fiscal year that we are going to be building. One of them is the Summit 2 or the Jasper tank, and the other one is the Stone Ridge tank. <clears throat> You're all pretty familiar with uh, the location of the Summit tank. Here it is along the the new trail that goes to the top of Glassford Hill. Um, so that's where that one's located. This tank will be constructed at the same site, at the same elevation, so that it will provide um, storage for not only the Jasper development, but currently it also serves portions of Granville and portions of Castle Canyon Mesa and Lynx Lake Estates. And it would also hold capacity for future development north of 89A. There's a couple of sections of land in there, uh, roughly three or four, that could be served by this tank as well.
So here's a, here's a picture walking up the trail. You can see the existing, uh, and that's a one million gallon tank. We're proposing that the new tank be a three million gallon tank. So we'll have a, to a total of four million gallons of storage up there. And I've got some Photoshop slides in here to give you an idea of what it might look like. So the new tank would go behind the existing one. The north edges would line up with each other, but because the three million gallon is quite a bit bigger, uh, you would see it sticking out to the south of the existing tank. And what I'm showing you is, is basically a reproduction of the existing tank there. So these are, these, this is what a steel tank would look like in that location. And if painted, it, it still would blend in pretty nicely. With the construction of a steel tank, we would also have some additional area of land where we would have a, a cut slope that ultimately would, um, you know, we would seed it and, and hopefully it would grow, grow back in, but there would be an additional area of land that you might, might notice there. This is looking more up, up close. One of the things that we would attempt to do is put a berm with, with some of the excavated materials. We bring a berm around the front of the tank to help hide, that, hide the new tank as well. You can see most of it's kind of hidden by that. Um, so that would be the intent, would be to, to try and landscape it to, to hide it. Looking from the north uh, east, like if you were standing over in Granville, this is kind of what you would see. That would be the new tank. And looking, standing directly north of the tank site, that's the approximate size of what the new tank would look like. Stone Ridge tank, the road and the um, mountain have been excavated out and that was done probably in about 2005. So that location, the site work, at least the prelim preliminary site work, site work has been done. And this is a picture of that site um, as of two days ago. Now I want to show you some pictures of some concrete tanks so you can get an idea of what a concrete tank might look like and, and um, how you might be able to use it. This one's interesting because this actually could look very similar to our tank site in that one side being potentially the north side of the tank would be fully exposed and we could actually bury back the south side of the tank and not have a cut slope where people could, you know, you, you wouldn't have to have maintenance all the way around, you know, a 10 foot or 15 foot uh, maintenance path around the south side of the tank to get to it to paint it or anything because concrete doesn't need to get painted and it can support the weight of, of the material. You can actually backfill next to part of the tank. So ours could end up looking very similar to this. Uh, I'm going to show you some other ideas here which may not necessarily translate into a tank that you would see in Prescott Valley, um, but I thought these were pretty, pretty neat pictures. So the center circle there that you're seeing, that's a water tank. It's under a, a park or a grass area. This is a water tank, a concrete water tank that's under a cul-de-sac in the middle of a subdivision. Here's one where they buried the tanks, but they are using the top for solar panels. That might be something that we could do here in Prescott Valley. I thought this one was pretty cool, and this will never happen in Prescott Valley, but, but underneath that water park or the uh, whatever that lagoon is for, there's a water tank there. Um, and Prescott actually has a couple of concrete water tanks. This is one that they've got, which is up in a neighborhood. Um, so there are houses right next to this tank on the back side. I'm standing at road level, actually slightly sunken in. Um, and if you walk, go around to the, the right-hand side of this tank, the road goes up and the road is actually level with the top of the tank. Um, and so you can see how this fits in into a, into a neighborhood area. They've taken the concrete and they've, they've stained it. Uh, so it's not painted, it is stained and added into the concrete. There's showing steps going up the side of it. There's the surface that they've stained, the top. So this is a, a, a picture from the roadway right adjacent to the tank around the other side. So, and, and you can see how close that house is right next door. So the advantages for the two different types of materials with the steel tank, the initial cost is lower and the life cycle cost on the smaller tanks 
seem to indicate that that's a more economical way to go. Larger tanks are, are for concrete. The ongoing maintenance costs are a lot lower, and that would pay back with a larger tank. And then over, above and beyond that, if you're looking for some advantage for aesthetics or site disturbance or flexibility, then the concrete tank has additional things that, that would help you with that. If you, if you don't care about that or you're just looking at a site where it can be either steel or concrete, then basically look at the size of the tank and, and make a decision based on that. So that would be the end of the, of the presentation. I have one more, one more thought, and when I was looking at those tanks, what I think would be neat is if you were able to use the top of the tank, because it's flat, if you were able to use that maybe as like a destination for people who don't want to go all the way to the top of Glassford Hill or can't make it, you could actually make the top of the tank pedestrian accessible and have like an overlook you have to put handrail or something around the tank. Um, but that was a thought. I think that'd be a neat idea, um, but something for you to think about and, uh, and provide some guidance on. And so with that, I'll open it up for questions or comments. Heidi, question? Yeah, uh, two parts. Uh, the concrete tank, uh, how long would it take to construct, and are there local companies that are capable of doing it? Okay, um, typically we would probably allow a three or four month construction period for this. Um, and the, yes, there are uh, local contractors can build the concrete tanks. Um, Fan Environmental can do it. Um, there, are, there are others, but yes, they can be built um, by local companies. Now, what we're looking at actually is a specific kind of a concrete tank. We're looking at a pre-stressed concrete tank which means what they do is they construct a concrete tank and then they have to get a subcontractor to come in and there are a couple of those that come in and they will actually wrap the concrete tank with a <coughs> cable and they'll go all the way around it multiple, multiple times and they'll put pressure on the outside of the tank. It's called pre-stressing it. And then they will do a shot creed on the outside of it. So that band is adding additional um, structural integrity to it, it pre-stresses it, and um, those tanks are, they, they build them all over the world, they build them in California, in, you know, in the zone four earthquake territory, um, but they would hire a, a specialty subcontractor to do that work. And the, ex and the outside of these concrete tanks could be uh, colored in any way we request? You can, you can add a stain to the, to the concrete to stain it a light tan. You could do it, make, do it a darker one to maybe make it look like, a con, like, an, like an outcropping, like what we see up on Glassford Hill. They can, you know, they can do something like yeah. that. And, and I, th I think it was really nice about those tanks that had the solar panels on them because we're putting solar panels near some of our other uh, tanks to uh, help run them. I, I think that's a great idea, and uh, it's, it, it looks really nice. So... Uh, there are some good ideas in there, and I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. Rick? I, I, I'm having deja vu. Uh, before we moved to Arizona, we lived on a big farm in Colorado. Our water tank at our big reservoir was concrete. And I often wondered when I came to Arizona why I didn't see concrete reservoirs. I mean, uh, tanks. And so what caused you now to look into all of this? If something happened. It, I'm sure it's financial, but all this time you've been building steel, and now you see the wisdom of concrete. What brought you there? Well, well a couple things. One, we, we've been thinking about concrete for a long time, but you also have to remember when was the last time we built a tank here, you know? So um, we purchased the water system in 1999, and between that point in time and about 2004, I think, you know, so there was a period of four or five years where we built a number of tanks. We built the Victoria tank, we built the Granite View tank, uh, we built the High Point tank on the Prescott Country Club, and then Quailwood built the tank you know so um 
most, you know, there, there, it was a, a short period of time where we did that work and steel was what we were familiar with. Um, and some of those tanks, you know, some of them are a little bit smaller and some of them are a little bit bigger, but um, now we're looking at doing a couple that are on the larger side. And so we've gone back to take a look at the issue of the concrete versus steel. And we didn't want to just go out there and build a concrete tank or a steel tank because that's what we've done in the past and we're familiar with it. Um, and we think the, the concrete will have some long-term benefits, especially in terms of the ongoing maintenance. One of the things that Larry's always talking to us about when we're developing our budgets is, you know, okay, we're looking at operational costs and how are we gonna keep those as low as possible? And so, you know, if we don't have to do maintenance as often or we don't ever have to do interior coatings on the, the tanks, that's gonna keep our, our long-term um, costs down. And so that translates into rate increases and things like that or, or the lack of rate increases. I remember my father laughing at a neighbor farmer who had to climb down into his metal tank and clean it. He never had to do that. Well, unfortunately, our weather here is better than other places back east where they might have, you know, might be harder. You know, steel tanks may corrode quicker. They've got to do coatings more often to keep them protected. And so we have a better environment here. So, you know, seeing a steel tank is not unusual and they work pretty good. Any other questions, Mike? Yeah, I just thought I'd mention, I like the uh, options as far as height, and that is to bury it or to keep it the same height. Uh, and it doesn't sound like you have a preference right now, for instance, at the uh, one off the trail there. What is, what is the height of the existing tank? Do you know? Just the general. tanks are 32 feet high, and, and it, feet. the tank's going to be exactly the same height and everything. Right. Um, and so, yeah, what we might be able to do is bury part of the tank, but, you know, the full north face will not be buried mm -hmm. um, if that's the way we end up going. Right. But, yeah, those are 32 feet high. And, uh, so in either case, construction would require a piecemeal approach, right? We don't have, like, a steel tank that's all together and transported to Correct. the site. The, in either case, the site has to be prepared. The site pr preparation is the same. Um, and then the contractor would either um, order in truckloads of, of steel and steel parts, and then they'd weld it all together. Um, or they would you know, get the f start forming up and, and doing concrete. Right. Um, so it's, and then at the end, with the steel tank, you would not do any additional site work in terms of right at the tank, um, but with the with the concrete one, you could you know backfill it or, or do something mm -hmm. like right. that. Right. Um, you know, we are looking at at concrete at the for the Stone Ridge tank site as well. Um, and unless our unless you know when we start talking to the designer about what's going to happen there, if they for some reason see a reason we can't do it, such as you know um, I don't know maybe trying to get concrete trucks up there or you know there may be some reason they might advise us not to but that's what we're going to look at um, that one as well if that's if we meet with your approval mm -hmm. okay thank you any other uh, questions I, I do have one more one more comment we are talking with an engineer about designing both of these right now and so we'll, we will be coming back to you in a couple of weeks probably with a proposal uh, based on any direction that you give me tonight. And what we're looking at doing is if we bid both of these out as concrete, we may get some economies of scale. If a contractor gets two tanks, you know, they might sharpen their pencils a whole bunch over just doing, doing one tank now and another tank later on. Um, so we will, be, we will be looking at that as well. So you do have a lot of data to back up of what you've shared with yes. us. Yes. Any uh, directions, Council? Bring it forward, Laura says. Anybody else? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Hit it, Neil. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you. Okay, stay there, Neil. <laughs> We're going to uh, number seven, discussion, Winsong Well Project, CIP number W423, Professional Services Agreement. Neil, you are up again.
Okay. So the wind song well. <clears throat> this one is kind of interesting. Has that been a real old well or is that fairly new? 2002, I believe, is when we drilled it. Uh, this map shows you where it's located, so you'll see the uh, intersection of Lakeshore and Windsong Drive there down at the lower part of the screen. This well is located behind uh, the apartment complex uh, right there. And so um, we drilled it in 2002. I'm going to put some comments up here. And we thought it was going to be a good well. Um, during the uh, drilling of the well, the contractor lost circulation, which sometimes can indicate that you're looking at a pretty good well. Not always, but it's, it's sometimes an indicator of that. And we think that what happened was that the contractor ended up using too much drilling mud. And so after they got done completing the well, we did test pumping and it would only pump a small amount. And historic, we equipped it after that, but it would only pump 75 gallons a minute. Now, you know what our other wells are capable of. Our, our biggest well is capable right now of about 2,400 gallons a minute. So when you're looking at 75, you're like, oh, well, this is really not worth keeping. And so um, we actually, with, as with a number of our other wells, five or six of them, we actually disconnected the power to it because APS charges money to keep a uh, uh, power uh, meter there. And uh, this, when we went into the recession, we took the meters out of about six of our wells because it was costing us $1,000 a month per well site just to keep the meter there. So this is one of them. Um, and back then there were some initial efforts to try and see if we could unplug the well or make it produce more. Um, not a lot of effort went into that, but we did some work and it was unsuccessful. Now fast forward to today and you know, we are looking at future production capacity. Where are we going to get it from? The potential, there's a potential for a well in Jasper. They've drilled a well there, and they're at some point in the future going to turn that over to us. They're getting right now, um, with the size that they've drilled, they're getting about 600 gallons a minute. And it's not fully drilled to the size that we would ask it to be drilled to. So, you know, we're looking at a well there that we know we're going to get at least 600 gallons a minute out of. But we're, we're going to need some future capacity, and we're also looking at, at other things as well. So does it make sense to either go find another well somewhere else and just leave the windsong well here um, and not use it? Um, we think it would be good to at least go back in and make one more attempt. Have somebody evaluate the well, the hydrology, um, look at maybe any, any changes in technologies that might have occurred over the last 15 years and say, you know, maybe we ought to try this. So um, we've asked Southwest Groundwater to uh, give us a proposal to do just that. And they may come back and say, you know, forget it. There's, you know, it doesn't, you're, you're taking too much chance. There's really nothing you can do. Or they might say, you know, let's spend a little bit of money and see if we can make this thing work better. The cost of drilling and equipping a brand new well just for the well site is about $750,000. And if it's not located near any of your existing infrastructure, then you have to put the pipe in the ground to get it out to that location. So depending on where that is, you're looking at $750,000 uh, 50, or more for a new well. So maybe we throw $150,000 at seeing if we can get this one to produce better. Is it a, is it a gamble? Yeah, there's a little bit of a gamble there. Um, but we're going to hire somebody, they're going to take a look at it, they're going to give us some advice, and then we'll have to make a decision based on that. Um, you know, maybe we can get 500 gallons a minute out of this well. We've got the Lake Valley well just across the street here. It pumps 400 gallons a minute. Why can't we get more out of this one over here? They're not that, they're not that far apart. Um, so, like I said, we've got a proposal from Southwest Groundwater for $15,700. Jim Holt from Southwest Groundwater is here. If you have any technical questions of him, um, I'm sure he'd be happy to come up and answer those. Any other questions, anyone? Mike? No, I'm just curious, how deep are these, the well over here versus the well on Winslow? They're about 1,100 feet. 1,100. So that's pretty normal, typical in terms yeah. of, yeah. 
You know, we typically, I mean, most of our pumping levels are about six or 700 feet deep. Um, <laughs> typically, we hit bedrock a lot of times at 1,000, 1,100, 1,200. Um, so that's gonna be one of the discussion points is, you know, if we, is there something we can do to, you know, if we're looking at seeing to, to make it produce more just as it is, or, you know, we're gonna, one of the things we wanna look at is, what if we pull everything out and try and drill deeper? It's costly, but could we drill deeper and get more water? Yeah, mm -hmm. So those are, those yeah. are some of the options. Right. My question would be of him, what technologies changed that you believe we could be successful in rehabilitating the well? <laughs> well, we're gonna find out. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, Councilwoman, the, um, the well actually has a couple of things going for it that might be useful for us to know. The material that was used after this well was drilled uh, may in fact have uh, degraded a little bit over time. Uh, and as a result of the town not using that well, uh, perhaps that material on its own may have degraded to a point where uh, it might be possible to restore the well. Uh, we do intend also as part of our scope of work to have some communication with the manufacturer of the uh, material that was placed in the well and uh, work directly and closely with them to see what kind of opportunities we might have as well. So the period of time I think since that well was drilled and not used may work in our favor. So I think that that's gonna be helpful. Yeah, a lot of things can happen in 12 years. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions, anyone? Anything else, Neil? Okay, if there is not, we'll move on then. I guess you're gonna bring that back to us, are you, Neil? Uh, I believe it'll be at the next council meeting as a consent item. Um, so there's a picture up there if you just wanna see what the well looked like. Sounds okay. Okay, we'll move on to number eight then. Discussion, Long Shot Well C Project CIP number WS424, Professional Service Agreement. You are back up, Neil. Okay. Well, you know, we've, we've talked about arsenic before, and I probably told you that there may come a point in time where we've got to do something about arsenic. Location shown above is what we call the long shot well located in the north well field, which is north of 89A. The uh, wells up in that area, including this one, typically produce about 500 gallons a minute of water. And with this well, we have had fluctuating arsenic results. In the last two years, we've taken seven samples from that location and four of the seven have been around 15 parts per billion. The federal limit is 10 parts per billion. So because of that, we have not been able to use that well um, in the system. And so, um, again, we have another well that's sitting there. It's potentially a $750,000 or more investment. Um, we would like to spend a little bit of money to see what we can do. Um, So Southwest Groundwater, we again, we've asked them to come in and give us a proposal. One of the things that they're gonna do is do some sampling down the well where they're gonna sample at different levels within the well. So they'll be able to sample directly from that part of the formation to see if there's an area where the arsenic is coming in that's more prevalent than others or at a higher, at a higher number. Um, there are ways that you can actually seal off parts of the well casing um, the risk is that if we do that, we're also sealing off some of the water bearing capacity, so we may have a reduced capacity or a reduced operating capacity in the well. Um, but we won't know until we get in there, do some sampling, and, and take a look at what our other options are. If we're not able to do something with the well, we've got two options beyond that. One is we go find another well and we just don't use that one anymore. The other option is to 
still use that well, but blend that water with water from another location or another well that's got lower arsenic concentration so that the resulting blended water um, has a number less than the 10 federal limit. Um, so, but that, that's got its own challenges. Obviously, that would require some capital dollars to be able to mix water together and, and uh, that sort of thing. So we thought first thing we need to look at is can we do anything with the well um, as it stands? And so that's what this proposal is for. Questions in the end, Marty? Yeah, uh, historically, uh, how successful has this process been for other wells to reduce the amount of arsenic coming out of it? This is, uh, it's something that you do on a case-by-case -case basis. Every well is different. Um, every formation is different. Um, if you can identify a location where there is definitely a water-bearing layer that's got a high arsenic level, it is, you, you can definitely go in and seal that area off. And so it only, it, what it comes down to is a matter of, as, as I mentioned, um, how much of the capacity do you re are you are you losing out of that well? Um, and so it, it would be possible to do that if they can identify an area. Um, it may not be possible to do it in this case. Have we that we can I can ask Jim to come back up up here if he wants to add anything to that. Uh, ha have we had that happen to any other well in our community, or is this the first one? This will be the first one. Okay. And I guess Jim's got some more experience with that, so. That's why we're planning on hiring him. <laughs> questions, comments? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I have no problem with the testing, and let's see where that goes. Uh, I personally have an issue with blending the water, but we'll see if it goes to that point. I don't know, that just, I'm, I'm bothered by that. But let's see if it, if it goes to that point. If we can stop it somewhere along the way like you're suggesting, then I, I have no problem with that. But let's see what happens. Right, and, and anything we end up doing is going to cost us money. And at that point, we would be coming back to you with a recommendation either to improve the well, you know, not use the well, or we need to now go out and look at the cost of doing other things. And that, that would be, the, as you mentioned, that would be the next steps after that. I just want to say I do like the fact that we're exploring all of these possibilities and opportunities. I, I think we need to be innovative, and I think we need to pay attention to changing technologies, and it sounds like we're doing all. I'm comfort, I have comfort zone with all of that. Other questions? Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm, this isn't the same well that we had this issue with before, right? We've actually seen a reduction in the arsenic level, or is this the same well? No, the well that we, are you talking about the well that we talked about a year ago? Right. No, yes. this is a different well. All right. The, the other well that we were, talked about a year ago was only on the initial pump start right and once we had been operating for a period of a half an hour or whatever that number is the groundwater levels in there it all equalized so it was probably there's probably a small formation in there that allows the concentration to build up when the well's been sitting but once you start pumping the well the hmm. the more uh, prolific formations have the lower concentrations and just completely overpower the other one, so that, that's what we're seeing, and that, that's a different right. level. So that's kind of the, the factors we're looking for in this analysis as well, yeah. Yeah, in this case, it looks like the major production zones have the higher concentrations now, and we're gonna see what we can do about that. And how long has this been offline since we've discovered that? Um, it, they have been doing some operating, I believe it's, I believe it's been probably nine months it's been nine offline. Months. We have operated from time to time as they're looking at the numbers, but um, you know, as we've been we've seen the samples come back and they've been high, we've we shut it off. They're able to operate it sometimes, but it, it's been getting fewer and farther between when we can actually operate it with any any. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I think 
You've done a good job, Neil. I, I, I do agree with uh, Rick. I think our community might be a little bit negative about blending wells to lower the arsenic. But anyway, you're ready to bring it back to us in a short time? You'll have it next week on consent. Agreeable? Great. Thank you. Good job, Neil. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think we've uh, learned a lot tonight. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.